Captain Use of your psychic strength and cunning, that is, those battles which are 
stretch the help of our common all and great creator for helping his need to actualize what he has forced him to the good of everything existing. In short, our common creator has given nature the corresponding principle that enables her to serve and adapt all your internal and external organs in accordance with that sphere in which the process of existence of beings with such a brain system is yours is destined to grow. To illustrate this, take your own donkey, now tied up in this stall. present existence alone, thus enabling it to manifest that power incomparably better than you. And these manifestations of the different powers of beings of diverse forms constitute in their totality the exterior conditions that alone make it possible for three brain beings like yourself consciously to perfect it. In their presence to the required gradation of pure objective reason. I repeat, all beings, large and small, and all brain systems without exception, existing on the earth, within the earth, in the air, and beneath the water, all the equally necessary to our common creator is a common harmony of universal existence. Yeah. 
So when I heard about this terrible event, there almost occurred in my presence a finishing our freedom. That is to say, the connections between my separate being centers were almost shattered. But later that same day I became afraid that some unconscionable being might commit further outrages on my friend's planetary body and I decided to ward off at least that danger. So I immediately hired several suitable beings for a large sum of money and, unbeknownst to anybody else, had his planetary body removed and placed temporarily on my Sultanic, so yeah, which was more not far away on the Oxfordary River and which I had kept there with the intention of returning on it to the Clarier Sea and to our fifth occasion. This sad end of my friend Abdo's existence did not prevent his sermons and exhortations from having a strong effect on a growing number of beings. And indeed the quantity of sacrificial slaughtering began to diminish perceptibly and it became evident that, even if this custom were not abolished, it would at least be considerably mitigated. And for the time being that was enough for me. As there was no reason for me to stay there any longer, I decided to return at once to the Kulidi of Sea, and then to consider what to do with the planetary body of my friend. When I reached our ship occasion I found enough aerogram from Mars, informing me of the arrival there of another party of beings from the planet Caratus, and asking for my speedy return. With that paragram, a very strange idea came into my head, namely, that instead of disposing of my friend's planetary body on the Earth, I might take it with me and give it to the presence of the planet Mars. I decided to carry out this idea, for I feared that in their hatred, my friend's enemies might make a search for his planetary body. And if they happened to hear where it had been returned to the presence of their planet Earth, as your favorite say, Terry, they would no doubt find it and perpetrate further outrages upon it. And so, on the ship occasion I soon ascended from the Corinthian Sea to the planet Mars, where the beings of our tribe, the parade of several kind Martians who had already learned of the events that had just taken place on the Earth, paid due respect to the planetary body that I had brought back with me. They varied it with the ceremonies customary on the planet Mars, and over the burial place erected a suitable construction. In any case, this was the first and the truly the last, grave, as her favorite Taya, for a being of the Earth on this at once so near yet so far and, for terrestrial being, quite inaccessible planet Mars. I learned afterward that this story came to the attention of the most great archangel Sephranitinarto, the all quarters maintainer of that part of the universe to which the system wars belong, and that he manifested his approval by giving to the appropriate being a command concerning the soul of this terrestrial friend of mine. On the planet Mars I did indeed find a waiting with several beings of our tribe, recently arrived from the planet Caratus. Among them, by the way, was your grandmother, who, according to the indications of the chief, the listener, of the planet Caratus, had been designated for me as the passive half for the continuation of my line. Chapter 20 the third flight of Beelzebub to the planet Earth. After a brief pause, Beelzebub continued. This time I stayed at home on the planet Mars for a very short while, only long enough to see and talk with those who had just arrived, and to give certain instructions of a common tribal character. Once these 
For my further tales concerning these three brain beings who have taken your fancy, it will be useful for you, I think, if I emphasize here that because of various disturbances during the second terrestrial catastrophe, certain parts of the continent of Iranan entered within the planet, while in their place other land masses emerged and attached themselves to it, with the result that this continent was considerably changed, becoming almost as large as the continent of Atlantis before the catastrophe. Well, my boy, one day while this group of hunters and their families were pursuing a herd of these for morals, they came to the shores of the water space later called the Sea of Beneficence. This sea, with its rich and fertile shores, pleased them so greatly that they no longer wished to return to the continent of Atlantis, and from then on they remained in that region. At that time this country was indeed so marvelous and so Christianian, the ordinary being existence that no being in his right mind could help liking it. Not only did great herds of the two brain beings called Shermaros exist there, but the shores of this water space situated in the middle of that country were covered with luxuriant vegetation, including vast numbers of fruit trees of many kinds, whose fruit then still serve your favorites as the principal product for their first being food. And there were also such multitudes of the one grain. And two grain beings called birds, that when flocks of them passed overhead, the sky became, as your favorites say, quite dark. The waters of the Sea of Beneficence so abounded with fish that you could almost catch them with your bare hands. As for the soil along the shores of the sea and in the valleys of the two great rivers flowing into it, every inch was so fertile that it could be used to grow anything you like. In short, the country and its climate so delighted the hunters and their families that none of them had any desire to return to the continent of Atlantis. So they settled there and multiplied, soon adapting themselves to the surrounding conditions and existing, as is said, on a bed of roses. At this place in my tale, I must tell you about an extraordinary coincidence that had important consequences both for the first settlers of this second group and for their descendants down to recent times. It seems that when the hunters from the continent of Atlantis decided to settle by the Sea of Beneficence, there already existed on the shores of that sea a being from their own continent who was very important at that time and who was an astrosover, that is, a member of a section of a learned society the like of which has never again appeared on the planet Earth and probably never will. This learned society was called the Society of Ostan. The circumstances that had brought this member of the Society of Ostan to the shores of the Sea of Beneficence were as follows. Just before the second catastrophe those genuinely learned beings then existing on the continent of Atlantis who had founded this truly great society became aware that something very serious was about to happen on their planet. So they set themselves to observe very carefully all the natural phenomena on their continent, but in spite of all their efforts they could not find out precisely what was impending. Somewhat later they sent certain of their members to other continents and islands, in the hope that by their combined observations they might learn what the anticipated danger was. These members were to observe not only natural processes on the planet Earth, but also every kind of celestial phenomenon. One of these members, the important being I just mentioned, 
chose the continent of Iranan for his observations and, having migrated there with his servants, settled on the shores of that water space later called the Sea of Beneficence. One day this learned member of the Afghans chanced to meet some of the hunters on the shores of this sea and, learning that they too had come from Atlantis, he was naturally very glad and began to establish friendly relations with them. Thus, shortly afterwards, when the continent of Atlantis was engulfed within the planet, this learned Afghan, having no longer a place to return to, remained with the hunters in that future Meralpli Sea. Later, the group of hunters chose this learned being, as the most intelligent, to be their chief. Still later, this member of the Great Society of Afghans married one of the hunter's daughters, named Ramallah, thus becoming the founder of the second group on the continent of Ashtar or, as it is now called, Asia. A long time passed. In this country, generations of three-brained beings arose and disappeared and, as everywhere else on the earth, the general level of the psyche of this group underwent many changes, sometimes of course for the better, sometimes for the worse. As their numbers grew, these beings gradually spread more and more widely over the country, though always preferring the shores of the Sea of Beneficence and the valleys of the two great rivers that emptied into it. Only much later a common center of existence was formed on the southeastern shore of the sea, and this city, named the city of Gog, became the chief place of residence for the head of this second group of beings, whom they called a king. This position of king became hereditary, beginning with the first chief they had chosen, the learned member of the society of Afghans. At the time to which my present tale refers, the king of the beings of this second group was the grandson of the great-grandson of that learned being, his name was Koniachin. My later inquiry and investigation showed that this king Koniachin had introduced a most wise and beneficial measure in order to approve it terrifying, evil that had arisen among the beings who by the will of fate had become his subject. And he introduced this measure in the following circumstances. One day King Koniachin observed that the beings of his community were becoming less and less capable of work, while scandals, robberies, and acts of violence were on the increase among them, as well as many other unpleasant incidents, which had never occurred before or only in quite exceptional cases. These facts surprised and grieved the king, who became very thoughtful and resolved to get to the root of this sorry state of affairs. After lengthy observation he finally came to the conclusion that the cause lay in a new habit of the beings of his community, namely, the habit of chewing the seeds of a plant then called, Dogulian. This surplanetary formation still arises on the planet Earth today, and those of your favorites who consider themselves, well-educated, call it Hopavarun, but the ordinary beings simply call it Hopi. As I have just said, the beings of Muralpi Sea had a passion at that time for chewing the seeds of this planetary formation, which had to be gathered only when, right, In the course of further observation and impartial reflection, the king realized that these seeds contained a certain something, which, when introduced into these beings, had the power to change completely, for the time being, all the established habits of their psyche, 
to the big saw, understood, sensed, and acted quite otherwise than they were accustomed to do. For instance, a crow would appear to them to be a peacock, a trough of water, a sea, a harsh clatter, music, would appear to them as enmity, insults as love, and so on and so forth. As soon as King Koniatin became thoroughly convinced of all this, he dispatched some of his closest and most trustworthy subjects throughout the land to issue strict orders in his name forbidding all beings of his community to chew these poppy seeds. He also arranged that those who disobeyed his orders should be punished and fined. At first, thanks to these measures the use of these seeds appeared to diminish in the country of Moralkisi. Very soon, However, it was discovered that this was not so. In reality the number of those who chewed the seeds was even greater than before. On realizing this, the wise King Koniathan decided to punish still more severely those who persisted in this habit. At the same time he increased the surveillance over his subjects and enforced punishment with even greater strictness. He himself began going about every where in the city of Gob, personally examining the guilty and netting out punishment, both corporal and moral. In spite of all this the desired result was not obtained. The number of those who chewed poppy seeds rose steadily in the city of Gob, and reports from other territory subjects would have showed a daily increase. It then became evident that many free-brained beings who had never before indulged in this habit now took it up nearly out of curiosity. One of the particularities of the psyche of the free-brained beings of that planet which has taken your fancy, that is, merely to try out the effect of those seeds whose use had been prohibited by the king and punished with such relentless severity. I must emphasize here that, although this curiosity had begun to be crystallized in the psyche of your favorites immediately after the law, loss of Atlantis, it never functioned so blatantly in the beings of former epics as it does in the contemporary free brain beings there, who was more of it, I dare say, than there are hairs on us. So, my boy, when the wise King Koniathan finally became convinced that he could not root out the passion of chewing, go to him, he's through fear of punishment, and saw that the only result of his measures had been the death of some of those punished. He repealed all the orders he had previously issued and once again began to think seriously about how to find a really effective means of destroying this evil, so lamentable for his community. As I learned much later thanks to an ancient surviving monument, the great King Koniathan then retired to his chamber and for 18 days neither ate nor drank, but only very seriously thought and thought. According to my most recent investigation, the king was particularly anxious to find some means of uprooting this evil because by that time all the affairs of his community were going from bad to worse. The beings who were addicted to this passion had almost ceased to work, the now of revenue into the communal treasury had entirely dried up, and ruin stared the country in the face. Finally, the wise king decided to deal with this evil indirectly, by playing upon the weaknesses in the psyche of his subjects. With this aim he invented a most original, religious doctrine, corresponding to the psyche of the beings of that time, and he propagated the invention of his by every means at his disposal. In this 
religious doctrine it is held, among other things, that far from the continent of Ashtar there is a large island on which there existed our Mr. God. You must know that in those days not one of the ordinary beings was aware of the existence of any cosmic concentrations other than their own planet Earth. They were certain that the scarcely visible, white points, far away in space were nothing more than the pattern on the veil of the world, that is to say, of their planet, for in their notions the whole world consisted, as I have just said, of their planet alone. They also believed that this veil was supported like a canopy on special Produce the goods rested on their planet. Well, it was asserted in that ingenious doctrine of the astute King Tonius in that Mr. God had intentionally attached to our souls, the organs and limbs we now have, in order to protect us against our environment and enable us to serve him effectively and profitably, and not him alone but also the Souls already taken to that island of his. When we die, and our soul is liberated from all these specially attached parts, it becomes what in reality it should be, and is immediately taken to this island where, in accordance with how it has existed with its organs and limbs on our continent of Ashtart, our Mr. God assigns to it an appropriate place for its further existence. If this soul has fulfilled its duties honestly and conscientiously, Mr. God leaves it to continue its existence on his island, but this soul that here on the continent of Ashpark has been idle or discharged its duties indolently or negligently, existing only for the gratification of the desires of its attached parts, or finally, has not kept his commandments, such a soul our Mr. God sends to a smaller neighboring island for its further existence. Here on the continent of Ashpark exist many, spirits, attendant upon him, who walk among us wearing, caps of invisibility, thanks to which they can constantly watch us unnoticed and report all our doings to Mr. God, or inform him on the day of judgment, we can conceal nothing from them, neither our actions nor our thoughts. This doctrine also said that our continent of Ashtark and all the other continents and islands of the world were created by our Mr. God only to serve him and the meritorious souls, already dwelling on his island all the continents and islands of the world are, as it were, places of preparation and storehouses for everything needed for this island of his. This island where Mr. God himself exists with the meritorious souls, is called paradise, and existence there is just roses, roses, all its rivers are of milk, and their banks of honey, no one there needs to toil or labor, everything necessary for a happy, carefree, and blissful existence is to be found there. Supplied in superabundance from our own continent and the other continents and islands of the world this island of paradise is full of young and lovely women from all the peoples and races of the world, and any one of them belongs for the asking to the soul that desires her. In certain public squares of that superb island are great heaps of jewels, from the most brilliant diamonds to the deepest turquoise, and every soul can take anything he likes without the least hindrance in other public squares of that beatific island or piled huge mountains of sweetmeats. Prepared with essence of 
Poppy, and Kim, and every show may help him trust as much as he pleases at any hour of the day or night. There are no diseases there, and of course none of those, life, or things, that gives us all no peace here and blight our whole existence. The other, smaller island, where for the rest of their existence our Mr. God sends the soul to his temporary physical parts have been lazy here and have not existed according to his commandments, is false, hell, all the rivers on this island are a burning pit, the whole atmosphere stinks like a stunt of base forms of horrible being broken into a full of never despair, and all the carpets, stairs, and beds are made of fine needles with their points sticking out. One very salty biscuit is given to each. So, once a day, and there is not a single drop of drinking water on the island, there are also innumerable other torments that the beings of the earth would not wish to undergo for anything in the world, or even to imagine. Well then, my boy, when I came to Moralty Sea for the first time, all the three brain beings of that country were followers of the religion, based upon the ingenious doctrine I have just been telling you about, and this religion was then in full bloom. The inventor of this ingenious doctrine, the wise King Toniachin, had undergone the sacred Rastuarno long before this, that is to say, he had died many years earlier but his invention, owing as always to the strangeness of the psyche of your favorite, had taken such a strong hold that not a single being in the whole country of Moralty Sea doubted the truth of its very original tenets. From the day of my arrival in the city of Gob I began, as usual, visiting the Kaltani, by this time known as Chaitanas. It must be noted that although the custom of sacrificial offerings was also flourishing at that period in Moralpoli Sea, it was not being practiced on so large a scale as it had been in Tikliami. I set about looking for a suitable being, in order to make friends with him as I had done in the city of Korkali. And indeed I soon found such a friend, but this time he was not a priest by profession. My new friend turned out to be the proprietor of a large, Chaitana, and although I came to be on very good terms with him, as they say there, I never had that strange feeling of kinship for him that had arisen in my essence toward the priest Abdul. I existed for a whole month in the city of Gob without reaching any decision or undertaking anything practical for my aim accompanied by a human. I simply wandered about the city visiting different Chaitanas, including the one that belonged to my new friend. During this time I became familiar with the manners and customs of this second group and also with the fine points of their religion and by the end of the month I reached the decision to attain my aim, once again, through their religion. After serious pondering I resolved to add something to the religious doctrine already existing there, and I counted on being able, like the wise King Toniachin, to spread this addition of mine effectively among the beings of that country what I added was the notion that they is spirit too, as was said in that great religion, walk among us wearing, Caps of invisibility, and watch our deeds and thoughts are none other than the beings of other forms existing among us that is just they who watch us and report everything to our Mr. God. 
The Wee Men not only fail to pay them new honor and respect, they even destroy their existence, both for our food and for sacrificial offerings. In my explanations I particularly emphasize that not only should we cease destroying the existence of the beings of other forms in honor of Mr. God but, what is more, we should try to win their favor and beseech them at least not to report to Mr. God all those little evil acts that we commit involuntarily. And I began to spread this addition of mine by every possible means, of course very cautiously to start with, I did so through my new friend, the proprietor of this, Titana, I must tell you that his, Titana, was one of the largest in the whole city of Dog, and was famous for its reddish liquid, of which the beings of the planet Earth are very fond so it was always filled with customers and with open day and night it had become a meeting place not only for the inhabitants of the city itself but also for visitors from the whole of Moralpli Sea. I soon became quite expert at converting all these customers, some individually others by speaking to them in groups. My new friend, the proprietor of this, Titana, believed so firmly in my invention that he was beside himself with remorse he was in constant distress and bitterly repented his former contemptuous attitude toward the beings of other forms and his treatment of them. Becoming day by day a more fervent advocate of my invention, he not only helped to spread it in his, Titana, the began of his own accord to visit others, Titanas, in the city of God to proclaim the truth, that so agitated him he held forth in the public markets and even went several times to the outskirts of the city to visit holy places, of which there were many at that period, established in honor or in memory of somebody or something. It is interesting to remark here that on the planet Earth, the stories that give rise to the establishment of holy places usually come from certain terrestrial beings called humbug. This disease of humbugging or lying is very widespread there. On the planet Earth people lie both consciously and unconsciously. And they lie consciously when there is some personal material advantage to be gained, and unconsciously when they fall ill of the disease known as hysteria. Besides the proprietor of this, Titana, there were a number of other beings of the city of God who began unconsciously to help me as they also had become ardent supporters of my invention, and soon all the beings of that second Asiatic group were eagerly spreading this invention of mine, and persuading each other that it was an indubitable truth that had suddenly been revealed to them. The result of it all was that, in the country of Moralpu Sea, not only did sacrificial offerings diminish but the beings of other forms even began to be treated with unprecedented attention. Such comical scenes were enacted there that although I myself was the author of the invention, I found it difficult to refrain from laughter. We witnessed for instance parts of such as these, a highly respectable and wealthy merchant would be riding to his shop one morning on his donkey. On the way a motley crowd of beings would pull him off his donkey and maul him within an inch of his life for having dared to sit on it. Then, bowing low before it, the crowd would escort the donkey wherever it chose to go. Or what is called a woodcutter, 
would be hauling a load of wood from the forest to market with his oxen. He too would be dragged from his cart and beaten, and then the crowd would very gently unyoke the oxen and escort them ceremoniously wherever they wanted to go. And if all this had happened in a part of the city where the cart might hold up traffic, the crowd would haul it to the market themselves and leave it there to escape. This invention of mine soon led to the appearance of quite new customs in the city of Dog. For instance, that of placing props in the public squares and at all the street crossings, where every morning the residents could leave their choicest morsels of food for dogs and other stray beings, and also the custom of going at sunrise to the sea of beneficence to throw in all kinds of food for the beings called fish. But the most peculiar of all is the custom of paying attention to the voices of one-brained and two-brained beings of various forms. As soon as your favorites heard the voice of a being of any other form, they would begin praising the name of their god and invoking his blessing. It might be the crowing of a cock, the barking of a dog, the mewing of a cat, the squealing of an ape, no matter what, it would always arouse them. It is interesting to remark here that on these occasions for some reason or other they would raise their heads and look upward even though, according to the teaching of their religion, their God and his assistants were supposed to exist on the same level as themselves, and not where they directed their eyes and prayers. It was extremely interesting to watch their faces at these moments. Pardon me, your right reverence, interrupted the Elzebub's devoted old servant Ahun, who had been listening to these tales with the greatest interest. Do you remember, your right reverence, how often in that city of God we ourselves had to flop down in the street at the cries of beings of different forms? Indeed I do remember, dear Ahun, replied the Elzebub. How could I ever forget such comical impressions? The fact is, he continues, turning to Hassan again, the three brain beings of the planet Earth are inconceivably proud and touchy. If someone does not share their views or agree to do as they do or criticizes their manifestation, they are very offended and their indignation knows no bounds. And if one of them should happen to have some power, he would order anyone rash enough to criticize his conduct or to behave differently from himself to be shut up in the sort of place usually crawling with rest and life. And if the ascended one should be physically stronger, and no one were looking, at least no important power possessing being with whom he happened to be on bad terms, he would simply give the offender a good thrashing, as the rushing sitter once thrashed his favorite goat. Well knowing this aspect of their strange psyche, I had no desire to offend them and incur their wrath. Furthermore, as I was profoundly aware that to outrage anybody's religious feeling is contrary to all morality, I tried when existing among them always to do as they did, so as not to be conspicuous and draw attention to myself. Here it will do no harm to point out that, owing to the abnormal conditions of ordinary existence there, the only beings of that strange planet, especially during recent centuries, who become notable and are therefore honored by the rest, are those who manifest themselves somehow or other more absurdly than the majority. And the more absurd their manifestations, 
The more stupid, mean, and insolent the tricks they play, the more celebrated they become, and the greater is the number of beings on their own continent, or even on other continents, who know them personally, or at least by name. On the other hand, an honest being who does not behave absurdly has no chance at all of becoming famous, or even of being noticed, however kind and sensible he may be. So, my boy, when Arahun mischievously reminded me of our ludicrous situation, I was speaking of the custom of attaching significance to the voices of beings of various forms and particularly to the voice of donkeys, of which for some reason or other there were a great many in the city of Gob. On that planet the beings of other forms make their voices heard, each at a definite time for instance, the cock crows just before dawn, an ape cries in the morning when it is hungry, and so on, the donkeys bray whenever it enters their heads to do so and, in consequence, you may hear the voice of that silly being at any hour of the day or night. Well then, it became customary in the city of God that whenever the sound of a donkey bray was heard, everyone immediately had to flop down and offer up prayers to their god and their revered idols I must add that nature has given the donkey a very loud voice, and its brain can be heard a long way off. So, as we walked along the streets of the city and saw the citizens flopping down at the brain of every donkey, we had to flop down likewise, so as not to appear different from the others, and it was this ridiculous custom, I see now, that tickled old of him so much. Did you notice? Dear Hassane, with what venomous satisfaction our old friend reminded me, after so many centuries, of my comical situation at that time. Having said this, the Elzebub, with a smile, went on with his tale. Needless to say, in this second center of culture on the continent of Ashart the destruction of beings of other forms for sacrificial offerings entirely ceased, and if isolated instances did occur, the other beings of that group settled accounts with the offenders without compunction. Having thus become convinced that I had succeeded so easily in uprooting, for a long time to come, the custom of sacrificial offerings among the second group of beings on the continent of Ashart, I decided to leave. But I had it in mind, in any event, to visit other large centers inhabited by the beings of Moralpoli Sea, and I chose for this purpose the region of the river called Nariatai. Soon after making this decision, I sailed with a moon to the mouth of that river and began to travel up it against the current. At each of the large centers we came to I was able to verify that there had already passed from the beings of the city of Gob to the beings of these places the same new customs and notions concerning the destruction of the existence of beings of other forms for sacrificial offerings. We finally arrived at a small town called Argonia, which in those days was considered the most remote point of the country of Moralpusi. It was inhabited by a fair number of beings of this second Asiatic group, who were engaged chiefly in extracting from nature what is called turquoise. In this small town of Argonia, in accordance with my usual procedure, I began to visit various Titanos, pursuing there, as always, the fulfillment of my principal aim. 
It was only after a month's travel, according to their time calculation, that our caravan from Ardenia came to places where nature had not completely lost the possibility of producing planetary formations in the soil, and is creating corresponding conditions for the arising and existence of various one-brained and two-brained beings. After all sorts of difficulties, at last, one clear morning, we reached the summit and suddenly saw on the horizon the outline of a large water space, bordering the shores of that part of the continent of Ashtar then called, Pearl Land. Four days later we arrived at the chief center of existence of the third Asiatic group, the city then known as, Hyamon. Having arranged for a place to stay, Ahun and I spent the first few days simply strolling about the streets of the city, observing the specific manifestations of the beings of that third group in the process of their ordinary existence. It cannot be helped, my dear Hassane. Now that I have told you the history of the arising of the second group of beings on the continent of Ashtar, I shall also have to tell you about the arising of the third group. Tell me, tell me, dear beloved grandfather. Cried Hassane eagerly. Then, with reverence, he looked at his arms and said with great sincerity. May my dear and kind grandfather become worthy of protecting himself to the degree of reason of the sacred Angkla. Saying nothing to this, the Elzebub only smiled and continued as follows. The history of this third group begins shortly after that period when the families of the Kermaro Hunters had first come from the continent of Atlantis to the shores of the Sea of Beneficent Sand, having settled there, had founded the second group of Asiatic beings. In those remote days, infinitely remote for your contemporary favorites, that is, not long before the second Transipalmian perturbation occurred to this ill-fated planet, certain consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer had begun to be crystallized in the presences of the beings of the continent of Atlantis, and this aroused in the knees, among other needs on becoming to three brain beings, to adorn them with various trinkets and to wear the famous talismans they had invented. And one of these trinkets, much prized then on the continent of Atlantis is everywhere today on the earth, was this, pearls, we have mentioned, pearls, are formed in 31 brain beings breeding in the salutary of your planet Earth, that is, in the part called Pentelistana, or as your favorites might express it, the blood of the planet, which is found in the common presence of every planet and serves the actualizing of the process of the most great common cosmic protoautodocrat, and there on your planet this part is called water. The one brain beings in which pearls are formed used to breed in the salutary or water spaces surrounding the continent of Atlantis, but on account of the great demand, so many of these pearl-bearing beings were destroyed that soon there were none left along the shores of that continent thereupon. When those beings who made the aim and sense of their existence the destruction of these one brain beings, that is to say, to destroy them only to procure that part of their common presence called pearls, 
for the gratification of their absurd egoism, found no more in the water spaces near the continent of Atlantis, these professionals began to look for them in other water spaces, and gradually moved farther and farther away from their own continent. Once during this search, their rafts were unexpectedly earned by prolonged, salutary Othnian displacement, or, as they say, storms, to a region abounding in these, pearl-bearing beings, where conditions were extremely favorable for their destruction. The waters that these destroyers happened to reach, and where these, pearl-bearing beings spread in large numbers, were precisely those surrounding the country then called Pearl Land, and now called Hindustan, or India. Single Coast For the first few days, these terrestrial professionals gave free reign to the information, already inherent in their presences, wantonly to destroy these one-brain beings of their planet, but later, after they found out, also by chance, that almost everything required for ordinary existence grew in abundance on the neighboring land mass, they decided not to return to Atlantis but to settle permanently in Pearl Land. Thereupon a few of these destroyers of pearl-bearing beings sailed back to the continent of Atlantis, and after bartering their pearls for articles still lacking in the new place, they returned to Pearl Land, bringing with them their families and those of their comrades who had stayed behind. Later on, others among those first settlers in this country, still, new, for the beings of that period, visited their native land from time to time to exchange pearls for various articles they needed, and each time they brought back with them more of their relatives and kinsmen, or simply laborers indispensable for their extensive activities. So, my boys, from then on, that part of the surface of the planet Earth became known to all the three brain beings there, and especially to those of Atlantis, as the land of beneficence. Thus, many beings from Atlantis were already existing on this part of the continent of Ashheart before the second great catastrophe occurred to the planet Earth, and when the continent of Atlantis was engulfed within your planet many of its inhabitants who happened to be saved, chiefly those who had relatives by blood or marriage in Pearl Land, gradually collected there, with a fecundity, proper to them they multiplied steadily, and began to spread over this part of their planet. At first they populated only two particular regions around the mouths of two great rivers, which flowed from the interior of the continent of Ashark and Empedinta. The vast water space just where many of the pearl-bearing beings spread but as their numbers continued to increase, they also began to settle in the interior of the country, although their favorite regions were still the valleys of the two rivers. Well then, my boy, when I first arrived in Pearl Land, I decided to attain my aim as before by means of the Kavakirnoni, existing there, that is, through their religion, but it turned out that at that time the beings of this third group of the continent of Ashark had several peculiar Kavakirnanas, or religions, each based upon a quite independent religious teaching, having nothing in common with the others. In view of this I began to make a serious study of these religious teachings, and, 
having ascertained that the one founded on the teaching of a genuine messenger of our common endless creator, afterward called Saint Buddha, had the most followers, I devoted all my attention to its study. Before telling you more about the three brain beings breathing on that part of the surface of the planet Earth, I think it necessary to remark, however briefly, that ever since the custom arose of having independent, Pavatirnanas, or, religion, there have existed and still exist among your favorites two basic kinds of, religious teachings. Single quote. One kind is invented by certain three brain beings in whom, for some reason or other, the psychic functioning proper to a chasma has been developed, and the other kind of religious teaching is founded upon detailed instructions revealed as it were by genuine messengers from above, who are indeed sent from time to time by certain of the closest assistants of our common father to help the three. Brain beings of your planet destroy in their presence the crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ tunda buffer. The religion then followed by most of the beings of co land, to which I devoted my attention, and about which I now find it necessary to tell you, arose in the following way. As the three brain beings of that third group multiplied, many of them were formed with Chasmamusian properties and began spreading ideas more maleficent than usual among the other beings around them, so that a special psychic property began to be crystallized in the presences of most of them, engendering a factor that greatly hindered the normal exchange of substances actualized by the most great common cosmic protoautodocrats. Well then, as soon as that lamentable result, again issuing from this same planet, became known to certain most sacred individuals, they graciously vouchsafed that a corresponding sacred individual be sent especially to that group of beings to regulate their being existence in a more or less tolerable manner, in accordance with the existence of the whole of that solar system. The sacred individual who was sent to them was coated with the planetary body of a terrestrial free brain being and was called, as I have said, Saint Buddha. This actualization took place several centuries before my first visit to the country of Po Land. At this point Passane looked up at the Elzebub and said, Dear Grandfather, more than once in your talks you have used the expression, Hasnama. Until now I have understood, merely from the intonation of your voice and the consonants of the word itself, that by this expression you designate a certain three brain being who always set apart from others as a favor, object of contempt. Me. Time, as always, and explain to me the real meaning of this word. Whereupon the Elzebub, with a smile peculiar to him, replied, as regards this, type, a free brain being for whom I have adopted this expression, I will tell you at the proper time. But meanwhile know that this word designates the already defined common presence of any three brain being, whether consisting of the planetary body alone or already could of with higher being bodies, in whom for some reason or other data have not been crystallized for the divine impulse of objective conscience. With no further explanation of the word, Hasnama, the Elzebub continued. Well, my boys, 
During my detailed study of that religious teaching, I also discovered that when this sacred individual had become coated with the presence of a three-brained being of that planet, and had seriously pondered how to fulfill the task laid upon him from above, he decided to accomplish it by the enlightenment of their reason. Here it must be noted without fail that at that time there had already been crystallized in the presence of Saint Buddha, as my detailed investigations made evident, a very clear understanding that during the process of its abnormal formation, the reason of the beings of the planet Earth becomes instinctotitulary and, that is, it functions only under the action of corresponding shocks from without. In spite of this, Saint Buddha decided to carry out his task by means of their reason, so peculiar for three brain beings, and he began informing that reason of theirs with objective truths of every kind. First of all, Saint Buddha assembled a number of the chiefs of the Third Asiatic Church and spoke to them as follows. My essence has been sent to you by certain enlightened and most sacred final results, who guide in perfect justice the actualization of everything existing in the universe, to serve as a helping factor for each of you in the striving to free yourselves from the consequences of those abnormal being properties which because of important common cosmic needs, were implanted in the presence of your ancestors and, passing by heredity from generation to generation, has reached you also. First, we have spoke about this again and in a little more detail, but only the certain beings he himself had initiated. This time he expressed himself in the following way. Yeah. 
about that is this, predisposition, passed by heredity to preceding generation, the consequences of many of the properties of the organ Kundabhaka began gradually to be crystallized in their presence. As soon as this lamentable factor in the presence of the three brain beings breathing on the planet Earth was ascertained, a corresponding sacred individual was sent here, with the all-gracious sanction of our common father, so that, having been coated with a presence like your own and having perfected himself by objective reason in the conditions already established on Earth, he might indicate the way and show you how to appear from your presence the already crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabhakar, as well as your inherited predisposition to new crystallization. During the period when this sacred individual coated with a presence, Like your own and already at the age of a responsible terrestrial free-centered being, was personally guiding the ordinary process of being existence of your ancestors, many of them did indeed free themselves completely from the consequences of the properties of the organ. Kundabhakar, and thereby acquired being for themselves personally or became normal sources for the arising of a normal presence in future beings like themselves. But even before this sacred individual's appearance here, owing to the many abnormal conditions of ordinary existence created by you, the duration of your existence had become unnaturally short, and consequently the process of the sacred, Rasgularno, had to occur very early to this sacred individual also, that is to say, he too, like yourself, had to die prematurely, without having time to accomplish the task assigned to him. After his death, Everything gradually became as it had been before, partly due to the same abnormal conditions of ordinary being existence and partly to that maleficent property in your psyche called, wise acting. Thanks to this property in your psyche the beings here, even of the second generation after the contemporaries of this sacred individual sent from above, gradually began to change everything he had explained and indicated, until ultimately the whole of his teaching was completely destroyed. Again and again the same action was taken by the most high common cosmic final result, and each time with the same fruitless outcome. And now, in this present period of the flow of time, when the abnormal existence of the three brain beings of the Earth, particularly of those on that part of its surface called Pearl Land, is becoming a serious hindrance to the normal harmonious existence of the whole of this solar system, my essence is manifested among you from above in order that here on the spot, together with your own essences and in the already established conditions, it may look for some way to uproot from your common presences those consequences still existing in you owing to the lack of foresight on the part of certain most faintly cosmic final results. After this, by means of various talks with them, Saint Buddha first clarified for himself and then explained to the others how the process of their existence should be conducted, and in what order their positive part should consciously guide the manifestations of their unconscious parts, so that the crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabhakar, and also the inherited predisposition to them, might gradually disappear from their common presence. 
And indeed, as my detailed research made clear to me, during the period when the inner psyche of the beings on that part of the surface of the earth was guided by this genuine messenger from above, St. Judah, those consequences so maleficent for them once more began to disappear from the presences of many of them. But to the sorrow of every individual with pure reason of any gradation whatever and to the misfortune of the three brain beings of all succeeding generations who arise on that planet, the first descendants of the contemporaries of this genuine messenger from above, Saint Buddha, fell victim to that evil property of their psyche, namely, wise Akring. Still one of the chief results of the abnormally established conditions of ordinary being existence there, and began to wiseacre about all his indications and counsels, and this time to super wiseacre, so thoroughly that all that reached the beings of the third and fourth generation to arise on that planet was what our honorable Molinasa Eden defined by the Lord. the 
properties of the organ tendon
When I first visited Pearl Land, most of the three green beings were, as I said before, followers of the religion. Based upon the supposedly exact counsels and indications of Saint Buddha, and their faith in this religion was unshakable. Boy, as soon as I 
I had realized what this misunderstanding was, and had ascertained what the dreams of Pearl and were all, without exception, convinced that they were already particles of Mr. Kana himself, and decided to make use of this misunderstanding and pertain my name, who also, through their religion. to point out that all those things Buddha has supposedly said that a being already has within himself a liberalizing a particle of the most great greatness, my detailed investigations quite clearly showed me that he could never possibly have said that. Fell into their habit of life action and began to manifest 
many comical aspects of their hibachi For instance, within a few of their months after I began spreading my invention, at almost every step you could see, when strolling down the street in the city of Kayamon, means walking on what are called and we walk on stage so as not to risk crushing some insects or others. Hey, little being just like themselves, as they now live. Many were afraid to drink water that had not been fresh or drawn from the stream or stream, fearing that tiny beings might have fallen into them and that without seeing them they would unwittingly swallow me. Many took the precaution of wearing what are called veils, dress their poor little beings existing in the air to accidentally enter their mouths or noses and so on and so forth. From that time on, in the city of Kayamon and its outskirts, and throughout Pearl Land, societies began to spring up new beings to protect. Name happened to 